Hi everyone, welcome to the Noetic Podcast and welcome to our seminar on uh, Michel de Montaigne's essays. I'm your sort of MC for the night, Jordan Klein, and I'm joined by my lovely host, CJ. And today we're going to cover uh, chapter two of book one of Montaigne's essays titled Of Sadness. And on that note, I'm going to hand the mic over to CJ. Yeah. Chapter two of sadness. So what I want us to do here is go along with the essay and approach it and discuss it as we may. Because the Montaigne's mm, sure. essays to me remind me of going down a river and sometimes we just have to respect the river no matter how many times maybe we want to control it or diverge some of the streams into where we want to go or put a dam near and say okay everything else is fine let's just stop it here we have to just get on a canoe and go with it because where he leads us where he takes us is all quite intriguing and I think useful even if it might seem like he's going off on a tangent about one thing mm -hmm. It's all a part of the journey. And if the journey is this river, then we just have to go with it. So Yeah, absolutely. That is at least my approach for attempting to discuss with you this this particular essay and mm -hmm. to maybe understand it and see what it, it tells us about being human and about sadness in general. Mm -hmm. Because obviously we live in a world now where we understand... Or at least are, understand more than they, they did back then about depression, oh, yeah, anxiety, all these certain things. So Yeah, the psychology behind it, the, yeah. the neurochemistry. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to, uh, to see, okay, what would a Frenchman in the Renaissance be able to tell us about sadness? Or at least what, mm -hmm. what does he have to think about it? Because it's, it's fascinating because he starts out this essay not really giving us a confident means of approaching this because he says look i'm free from this feeling you know more than most men are you know i am not as sad mm -hmm. as everybody else he just gets it out of the way real quick yeah and i like i i really enjoy how uh forthcoming montaigne is on his own Blunt, yes. like the last uh essay that we were looking at about him saying yeah i'm pretty much a softy so, I mean, for him, just, yeah, exactly, just out of the starting gate, he just says, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm happier than most people. Yeah, and then and then he says, I, I don't love sadness or admire it, but he notices and he says that, well, the world seems to admire sadness. There seems to be this right. fascination mm -hmm. with it. And, and in my translation, he says, although the world has agreed, as if by common consent to honor it with a particular favor, they clothe it. They clothe therewith wisdom, virtue, and conscience. It has this mm -hmm. sort of positive spin that if you're sad, there is some sort of silver lining to it. Yeah, and I kind of think that it's, um, I think, sort of the romantic notions that sometimes we tend to think about when people are brooding. Mm, oh, oh, yes. they're brooding. Oh, they're so poetic and the tortured and artistic yes you know no one no one ever wants to hear about a happy artist or no. a, someone that just wakes up every morning saying you know what i'm ready to go do what i love and that's making art no we like the agonized people yeah that that is exactly mm -hmm. what i was going to say so i'm glad you brought that up this idea of the suffering artist yeah the, is what the tortured we, soul is how we at least take sadness as this virtue mm -hmm. in some respect that if somebody has melancholy then they can take that and put it into an art form and to make it really sing a particular musician who did that at around this time was uh, john dowland who was mm -hmm. a lutenist and a writer of song and a lot of his work deals with sadness and, and many would say, and he was an Englishman, by the way. Mm -hmm. So maybe that would deal with Montaigne saying, well, all these other places seem to deal with, you know, seem to make sadness this great 
thing. So maybe maybe he's looking out at other cultures and other yeah. countries and saying, why are you portraying this in a positive light? And that's not to say that John mm-hmm. Dallin didn't portray sadness in a positive light. Right. Obviously, a lot of his songs pertain to the crushing magnitude of solace. But, or not of solace, of lack of solace. Right, right. But, again, there is this idea that you use sadness as fuel and we tend to look at fuel for creativity and the arts in Mm -hmm. some sort of positive light but Montaigne being the good scholar he is mentions that well you know it's kind of fascinating because if you look at the Italian translation which is tristeza I believe I'm saying it right he says that that's probably more agreeable to what sadness really is which is a malignity. Right. Mm-hmm. That is what sadness is. It is some sort of big malignity. And and then he goes on, and again, like we mentioned last time, he's going to throw the Stoics in there too. Yep, going to sprinkle them in gotta for good measure. Got to sprinkle them in there to make sure you got to add a little salt. you got mm-hmm. to add a little bitterness to, mm-hmm. to bring it out. And I think, you know, even, even if you don't know what the Stoics believe, I think it's... Pretty, and if you think of being stoic, Jordan, I don't know if you think of being sad. Mm, Yeah, no, I definitely think of just a stiff upper lip. Yeah, so Mm -hmm. there's this idea that, okay, the stoics just look at it as degrading and cowardly that Mm -hmm. no noble soul would ever succumb to such feelings, right? Mm -hmm. But, But this is where... Montaigne says, wait, 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 hold on, hold the phone, because I have to go back in history to show maybe a moment where somebody did succumb to this sort of sadness, and that by maybe looking at this example and maybe a couple others, we can get at what sadness is. It almost seems as if he's saying, well, if we just say, okay, sadness is bad, then how can we come to understand it? Right? Yeah, I think it's one of those things that if you just quietly label it and put it on a box, like just sort of put it, you know, label it, put it in a box, and put it on a shelf, then you never really get to fully understand what sadness is if you just sort of uh, immediately uh, sort of uh, just kind of describe it and then move yeah. on. And it's quite surprising coming from a man that says, well, I'm not sad at all. You would expect somebody like that to, like you said, put that box on the shelf. But Montaigne says, well, wait, this, this the whole point of me writing these essays is to understand myself mm-hmm. and to try to understand human condition, you know, mm-hmm. which is, which I am a part of, right? Right. So yeah. he's not going to just put it on the shelf. He's going to be like, okay, well, well, wait a minute. I need to try to understand this sadness because obviously I see it in the world Mm-hmm. I would see it in somebody next door. It's not just going to be in the history books, but history always serves a way for us to look at these things. Yeah, and I think, too, a little bit of uh, biographical information. I think that um, I'll have to double-check this, but I'm I'm pretty confident that he embarked partially on this writing progr- uh, uh, sort of project, excuse me, mm-hmm. uh, was to help actually deal with his own grief because he lost Mm. a friend and I think that he lost a a, a close family member. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that he's sort of writing about sadness and grief uh, while sort of experiencing it himself to a degree. Right. So So he's giving himself some sort of distance to it, but then by exploring it through all these other examples, I think that he's able to kind of tease out what that experience of grief and sadness yeah, and is. Embedded, and mm-hmm. embedded in that too is mm-hmm. this idea of labor being a means of quelling sadness in mm-hmm. some respect. A Not so much a contemporary, but maybe a spiritual contemporary in, in another land. A couple hundred years later, uh, Samuel Johnson, who was a great writer, thinker, all-around gentleman, if you want to say, <laughs> pretty snazzy guy. Pretty, he was. I mean, you you can you can quote me on that. But okay, <laughs> he even dealt with a lot of sadness in his life and depression. But he mentions time and time again that labor, in some way, productive labor, mm-hmm. and for him, writing 
mm-hmm. because he oh, yeah. was a writer by trade. Right. Was a way to deal with these feelings. So, in a sense, Montaigne, mm-hmm. through writing about sadness, just in the fact of writing... Yeah, he's able to work through he's it. He's able to deal with it. Yeah, that mm-hmm. writing is in of itself a cathartic experience. And yeah. I don't know if we just look at the essays in general. Just just being able to write all of this. I mean, people in Radioland can't see this, but this is pretty thick. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of stuff. There's a lot of feelings in there. There are a lot of feelings in there. And <laughs> yeah. when we're when you're able to put that out and write all of that, mm-hmm. there is some way of releasing those feelings and maybe coming to understand not only yourself but the world right so let's see how montaigne sure. understands sadness in one particular example he has two at least that touch on the same thing but i want to deal with one here and it's dealing with semantius or semanitus who was the king of egypt at, at, at this time that he was the king of Egypt and he was captured by Cyrus who was the king of Persia right mm-hmm. so he is Cyrus chained the great, no, Cyrus the Great Cyrus the Great yeah pretty cool guy that's important he was great so great that he chained up Semenidus and he put him there Semenidus is just sitting there and the story goes is that he watches first he watches his daughter go along dressed as a slave and she goes to fetch water Mm -hmm. and everybody else is freaking out at least those who are captured right and yet when we look at semanitis he is fine he's not crying or anything Mm -hmm. like that so okay second person walks by it's his son and his son is being sent to death Again, everybody else is going crazy and crying, but Semenidus, again, not showing that much. Mm -hmm. And then, finally, we get one of his friends. In other places where the story is told, it's a servant. A servant walks by. And that is when Semenidus breaks down. At least in my translation, Montaigne says he's begin, he began in an excess of grief to beat his head against uh, the wall or the sand or something. He just his beats fist. his Who head. Knows? Yeah, he's just racked with grief. Mm-hmm. And Montaigne is just wondering, like, why is this? Why does yeah. this happen? So... Why why did the last shock get him, right? I mean, mm-hmm. why was the why was it the last one? Yeah, and I think that especially for a, a modern reader, we would think, well, that that's abs- that's absurd. You mm-hmm. know, like of course you would be completely bereaved seeing your your children led away either in chains or to the executioner's block just because we have that affectionate relationship with our children. And that's a that's a great point too because I think Montaigne's thinking the same thing. And he's just as confused. He's like, "Okay, well, and he and he he goes along and he says, "Well, you know, and to quote him, the truth is that being already full to overflowing with sorrow, the slightest addition broke down the barriers of endurance and that that was what made Semenidus cry mm-hmm. right that it just it, it's almost as if you just add he's you add water you keep adding water you keep adding water until that final point and it just overflows and he says well that would make sense with semantitis right i mean mm-hmm. i don't know if you've experienced a moment where maybe you something bad happened mm-hmm. and you didn't feel anything or maybe you did feel something and then it just got to a point where you just overflowed and you're just like ah yeah, I think or, we've I all mean, have. In yeah, some I mean, if you think about it, you know, in the moments that you hear some like terrible news, like someone you know got into a car accident, or someone, you know, you get that text of someone's in the hospital. I mean, there's always that moment of just, uh, just like this. Luckily, I think like this sort of arrest of like emotion and feeling. You were just like stunned. And that is what Montaigne is trying to understand 
And I think that is what he keys on when he says, okay, the first the first explanation that we gave would be perfect. That would, that would make sense, right? You just, sadness is this thing, you just keep going, you keep Cumulative going, keep going, and then you're just like, blah, and then you let it out. Right, yeah, it's just overflowing. But However. he said that would make sense, except we forgot the last part of the Samantha story. And... He it ends with somebody asking, "Well, why why did you cry at your servant and not anybody mm-hmm. else?" And and this is quoting Montaigne, quoting Semenidas, quoting somebody's story of of <laughs> this. Semenidas says that the last calamity alone could find a vent in tears, the two first being quite beyond the power. Of expression, mm-hmm. stunned, yep. and this—if we're talking about our river here, this is where we're, we're going along, going along, going along. And the Montaigne says, "Wait, hold on." The river takes a quick turn because mm-hmm. he's touched upon this idea of like, "Wait a minute!" Now we are dealing with this idea that there's some events that are just so intense, you have no means of portraying it outwardly yeah and i think that it's one of those things too that when you experience such a profound sorrow it there are just some things i think that just absolutely just defy expression yeah and he's even going to discuss like there, yeah, yeah. yeah there aren't words to put to something like sure that, or even mm-hmm. to paint because he's gonna right. later mm-hmm. on discuss yeah. how Timanthes, this one painter, was depicting the the sacrifice of yeah. Iphigenia. Iphigenia, <laughs> thank you, Jordan. Mm-hmm. He's been depicting the sacrifice of this young woman, and he's drawing all the onlo- all the onlookers are in horror. Right, they're all crying, they're all showing emotion. But then when we get to the maiden's father. Right. Montaigne's going to say, and I, and I quote, Having exhausted the resources of his art, Timanthe's art, he painted him with his face covered, thereby indicating that no expression was capable of doing justice to a parent's sorrow. That, like you said, Jordan, that there's just sometimes these moments where you can't put it to words. Mm-hmm. Where you can't even put it to your face. Where you yeah. can't, you know, you, you. How do you draw out, or how do you depict a parent's sorrow? There, it, there's just, it just seems like you. Can't, see, I, I'm just, I'm bubbling because it's. It seems impossible. Mm-hmm. So. We're left with this really. Fascinating thing, and he goes on again. He uses this example of Niobe who was mm-hmm. this wretched mother uh, quote unquote Montaigne who, in Greek mythology I guess mm-hmm. yep. who lost all her children most of her children and then Ovid writes that she was petrified by evils mm-hmm. and Montaigne will go on to say and I quote him indeed the effect of an affliction when extreme must of necessity be to stun the whole soul and hinder its freedom of action yeah so we're dealing with this this stunned moment but but Jordan, it was interesting because you're talking about okay you get stunned but then doesn't usually usually something breaks though right like you you feel stunned i don't know maybe yeah. like in those moments where like you just you hear the news and you're like Ugh! and then you're like and then, yeah, like, and there's that, like, there's, maybe moment right. of time in between, and you just... Mm-hmm. I think it's, like, that level of processing, and I think what's really interesting is that Montaigne, it's kind of, like, a little bit like what we experienced with Marcus Aurelius, is that mm-hmm. he's, I think, sort of going through all of these, these sort of, like, processes. Yeah, and, and that is a particular process that mm-hmm. he finds... To be worthy of note, because at least I'll quote him again. He says, "You know, until the soul, and that like after it's stunned, right? After that, Mm -hmm. he says, until the soul, after melting into tears and lamentations, 
appears to disengage and unravel itself and become more at ease and free to act. So there's this sense that even after you're stunned by this moment, your your soul seems to unravel in some way and is free to act. Even like after you go through these this lament, your body just disengage, or at least all of those tight knots seem to disengage mm-hmm. and you're free to act. Though what's fascinating is that he has this example of so even when the body doesn't like when when we're talking about disengaging, mm-hmm. the example he uses is like okay, disengage as in dies. The person just yeah falls in the most dead. extreme case. Mm-hmm. Right. So right. we have this German knight. I'm not going to pronounce his name, who notices at least when he's back from battle that all these people are surrounding this one mm-hmm. soldier who is valiant and fought quite heroically. And he says, okay, well let me go on to see what's going on. And he notices that it's his own son who has fallen and and, and died. And Montaigne, I'm going to quote him again. He says, Whilst all were moved to tears, the soldier alone stood there, dry-eyed and without a word, fixedly staring at the corpse until the violence of sorrow froze his life's blood and he fell stark dead to earth. Mm-hmm. So there's this initial stunned moment where right, he's yeah. not showing anything. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, his body just... Uh, gives out. Gives out. Yeah. It disengages, in a, or at least that built-up emotion, as Montaigne says, disengages and unravels itself. And that it just gives. And mm-hmm. in this case, it gives to... The most extreme, which the is just your extreme. heart, your heart stopping. Yeah, though it's interesting that you bring up heart stopping because Montaigne also sees this in love, which is a fascinating yeah. another. Again, if we're talking about a river, we're going we're going down another stream here mm-hmm. because Montaigne says, "Wait a minute!" But he also what does this sounds like? Yeah, exactly. So he pivots towards love, and I think it's so interesting that. Love is a part of affliction. Mm-hmm. You know? mm. Affliction in what way? Oh, well, I mean, and if you think of it, it's it's suffering, right? Mm-hmm. So to it's it's weird that and it's interesting that he sort of binds that that loss of potentially loss of love with you know, family or sort of in the erotic sense it just seems kind of strange that there's that maybe that intense connection that that love of someone that you feel equally grieved or tormented Mm -hmm. when you lose that person well we were were talking about the tortured artist right Mm -hmm. yeah and think of think of all the songs all the quote-unquote love songs are they all they're not always positive are they they're like miserable for the most part broke up with somebody Mm -hmm. i have to and again when you break up with somebody, you always listen to those Bad songs song. about love that in some way... Adele like, on repeat. Right, that, <laughs> again, if we go back to the beginning, that seemed to put some sort of gilded lily mm-hmm. upon love and say, look at love, I mean, not love, but on sorrow and say, it's okay to be sad, yeah, yeah. or not, not, it's okay to be not okay, I just want to make sure that that's on the outset, yeah, but at least it... stress that. It makes it a virtue, or it makes sadness into a virtue, which Montaigne saying is like, wait a minute, I don't think it is. So, it's it's fascinating, it makes this connection, and I think it's great that you mm-hmm. mentioned that too, that it is this affliction, that it is, yeah. that it is equally some sort of affliction. I think Montaigne says, you know, the soul is then weighted with heavy thoughts, and the body struck down and languishing. Languishing, mm-hmm. languishing with love. With love, yeah. And I think I, I love this with Seneca, the uh, the quotation: "Light cares find words, but the heavy ones are dumb." Yeah, and I think that's and that that that's... sort of grief that I think yeah. that extreme sort of passion that's so irrational we can't even wrap our minds around it. Like that sort of almost i almost think of it in terms of of plato sort of a little bit the symposium of that that animalistic like intense love of like 
yeah, your family or a beloved or whomever. Mm -hmm. It's just that it, it just defies reason and it just def like just completely escapes our own explanation. Yeah. Because there's and almost a level of frenzy, right? There is. And I mean, he even... Hell, we're not going to stop with love. He even says, mm -hmm. enjoy, there's this same sort of expression, right? Yeah. And there's so many examples that he gives, too, in history of, of, of joy just overtaking somebody to the point, just like we were talking about with the German soldiers, that they fall dead. Yeah. I mean, one, I can give maybe two particular ones. One was Pope Leo X, who, after being overjoyed of hearing that, that they took Milan, he took him a fever, mm -hmm. and he passed away. Yeah. And then there is Thalna, who I'm assuming is some sort of soldier of some sort. I, I don't know who Thalna is, but she or he or she died in Corsica after reading the news of honors which the Roman Senate bestowed upon him. Never mind, it's a he. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So there's this idea that joy can in some sense overtake us and unravel its or unravel us to the yeah. point that it could kill us too and then let's not forget shame as well and i think he prefaces it with yeah. i think we were both laughing at this and he says and as a more notable testimony of human weakness he he adds this idea or this story of Diodorus who died of shame after not being able to refute an argument by a certain verbal adversary. Yeah. So it seems like Montaigne is getting at this general motion of our bodies when we overcome something that, like you said, or like Seneca said, but like you said about Seneca... Mm -hmm. makes us dumb or makes us stunned like you said mm -hmm. that the body just breaks down it it can't bear these and mm -hmm. not even our own body but our tongues we can't talk about it we can't express it we can't paint it that mm -hmm. these emotions seem to defy us as humans and I, and I think i want to emphasize yeah, absolutely yeah, i think it's so that. interesting too especially since i don't know, like montaigne like red stoicism and the last essay we looked at uh lauded mm -hmm. stoicism and it seems like to me this is so cool because this is like a total like pushback against he's just like yeah like sometimes your body just goes haywire and you just don't have any control over it and sometimes you don't have any control over your feelings yeah, for sure. And Even, sometimes yeah. they just run riot, and there you go. In good and bad, which <laughs> yeah, I think is, exactly. is the big part, too, because I think right. with stoicism... It's like the extremity yeah. of uh, emotion. Yeah, anything. I think with stoicism, mm -hmm. it deals mostly with, you know, at least when we discussed it, we were talking about terrible events, right? Yeah, right. And also positive events, mm -hmm. too. But, like you said, it's just the... These, sometimes our bodies can't even take it to the extreme. Like you said, the extremity emotions, sometimes an event just happens that even if you tell yourself, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. I mean, yeah. I how many times have we, right. we've probably oh, experienced yeah. that or other people have experienced that or, where you yeah, just say, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. And it's just something that Oh yeah, breaks you absolutely. Down. And like there's certain things too where, you know, I mean, I don't know, I'm sure you've experienced this where you've had just like a terrible day and you have just weathered you know every everything go wrong and then it's you know something as simple as i, I don't even know like someone yeah. you know what i mean like it's just something as like trivial as uh someone that serves you coffee not putting the lid on all the way and some mm -hmm. of it's spilling on you and, like, that's the thing. It's not your car breaking down. It's not leaving your house 17 minutes late. It's not getting caught in traffic and almost getting, you know, clipped right. by it someone. It has nothing to it's do with that. the it's extreme event. Yeah. Right. It's you never don't the see, extreme yeah. event. It's the 
I'm gonna have a meltdown over <laughs> the coffee lid not being fully secured. Right, That's, but you can't control that. Like yeah. they don't say that in Stoicism. They don't say, "And at every coffee cup, thou shall not <laughs> feel the pressure of thine coffee cup." Like they don't, they don't talk about that, yeah. right? And it just happens. I mean, I I might have an example that's a little more extreme than that, but um. Our, our old dog passed away, and I didn't really have any emotion to that. Mm-hmm. Or I guess maybe it was like like that. I just couldn't put it into words, and it was just like, oh, it happened. Yeah. But it was only after I saw my dad cry about it that I... Right. That, that yep. just Niagara Falls just bursted yeah. from my eyes, right? Mm-hmm. That it wasn't even my own sorrow. It was witnessing somebody else's. Yeah. And maybe that goes back to the whole right. idea of pity that we explored in the the first essay. But this mm-hmm. idea that, like you said, it's not you. It's not the experience happening right. to you. It's some exterior thing mm-hmm. that we can't control. And then our bodies give. And then we cry. Yeah, and then we right. experience these emotions. There doesn't seem to be any control of it at all. And I think I want to emphasize again the little the little bit Montaigne had. I mean, mm-hmm. again, he was talking about the that, that person dying from shame right. of an argument. But Been there. again, <laughs> he says, as a more notable testimony of human weakness. Testimony of human, human weakness. weakness yeah. Human weakness. Yeah. That maybe what this essay is showing is that we are again fickle creatures. Yeah, I mean, I love that just the common thread of him saying that we're fickle. We don't know what we're doing, and we don't know what we're feeling most of the time. And maybe, and, and I think that's really funny because <laughs> he ends with him with him no saying that like on. I again, and I'll quote it just because I think it it bears. Yeah, absolutely, go for it. Because I don't think I can summarize it. He says, I am little subject to these violent passions, being naturally slow to apprehend, and this tendency becomes every day more crusted over and hardened by reason. (laughs) Now, it almost seems to go with what you're saying. I mean, we can interpret this in many ways, but maybe one way that goes with everything that is worth saying is that I almost interpreted it like he's just saying, like, I'm dumb. I can't. What is is sorrow? Like, he can't process these. Mm Mm-hmm. These emotions, or even, you can't even process and realize the extent of what's happened to him. He can't process it. And in that way, he's admitting a fault, even though he's saying, like, I don't succumb to this because... Yeah, and I think what, I mean, it's kind of interesting is that, you know, for, like, the the whole idea of being crusted over and hardened with reason. Yeah, that was... To me, I don't know, that kind of, I feel like that almost, like, ties in with, like, the last essay, doesn't it? Because if you're kind of, like, crusted over with this sort of, like, stubbornness, then you can't feel anything. So who knows? Maybe, maybe those people who aren't sort of, uh, that, I'm trying to, I'm trying, sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to articulate this. Maybe the people... In the last essay that we did um, on sort of people who are begging for their lives are actually sort of almost cognizant enough to realize that the stakes, the fact that they are going to get wiped out and like Mm -hmm. all their loved ones are going to die because they aren't sort of like congealed with this reason that makes people have these blinders on. Mm -hmm. So maybe in a weird way that he's becoming more sort of close-minded with this sort of reason Mm -hmm. that's kind of like growing over him that i almost picture like an algae or something you know yeah but but i do like what you said though that it's almost as if it's just kind of making him it's obscuring his like emotional scope kind of right and that and that modern psychology goes into that too right so i mean that could be him kind of getting at some idea of of sometimes people there are some people that just can't take social cues or emote mm-hmm. as as much as other people can or take yeah. empathy, right? So maybe mm-hmm. he's admitting to some sort of psychological deficiency in and of himself too. Yeah, or and some sort of variance. That we sure. have these, mm-hmm. we have, I mean, again, we're talking about this sort of spectrum, right? We have this, right. Mm-hmm. these crazy emotions that we experience, sadness being the main yeah. one he's discussed. and But then he also talks about maybe a lack of experiencing any emotion at all. Yeah, which is which is also 
a deficient, which is also a human weakness. Mm-hmm. So, so it almost seems that, I mean, as much as he is talking about sadness, he's getting at just, again, how we are, we, you know, we were just, our, our human bodies and our human emotions sometimes are what we can't control. And that there, there are these moments, like you said, even, even if it's from seeing our son die to a coffee lid mm-hmm. not being on. But there are these things that's, that our body can't, or that we can't take. And that even if we tell ourselves, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine, they just overtake us. Yeah. And, and leave us in these moments of sadness yeah, and maybe or joy what, or anything. Yeah, and I think maybe like what Montaigne is saying is that sort of by, by default of being human, we're kind of just strapped in for the, for the ride. Mm-hmm. The good and the bad. Yeah, and, and and it's it's important to note for me too that you know while being strapped in there that we are dealing with this way of taking certain extreme events that we can't you know as as much as we're being strapped on for the ride sometimes we can't explain those explain or quantify or acknowledge these quite terrible moments of our lives Mm -hmm. right or when we are completely stunned by sadness or when we're overtaken by love or joy that we can't take it it almost seems like we can't take it yeah and and i don't know if that's a necessarily negative thing but in some sense it's like you said we're just strapped along for the ride this is what you're dealing with is that as he's getting at, you know, using sadness as this vehicle, but for all of the extent of human emotions that there can be this point where your body, like you can, I think like you're alluding to, you can only control so much of it. And that then there are some things, or you can only control so much of it and explain so much of it mm-hmm. and try to comprehend so much of it that it gets to a point where some of that you can't control you can't comprehend you can't express you know like you said there's there's something or at least how semantic said there's you know things that are quite beyond the power of expression yep Mm -hmm. yeah i thought it was kind of interesting that when he referred to uh niobe and uh her being sort of petrified by evils and it Mm -hmm. quote expresses uh Quote, that dull and mute and deaf stupefaction which paralyzes us when crushed by a calamity that exceeds the power of our endurance. Yeah. So it's kind of, it's interesting to see that there's that scope of emotion that can completely outstrip our own sort of rational capabilities. Right, because if we're thinking about stoicism, we're all... Well, it's supposed to be and powerful reason, and reason. Reason is supreme and reason can ultimately dominate emotion. But I think that the case that uh, Montaigne may be making here is that it's the converse. It's that there's sometimes where emotion can just suppress any sort of faculty of thinking that we may have. Mm. And that may be good or bad. Right. And again, you know, that I think that is a testimony of... of human weakness mm-hmm. and i mean that in the most empathetic way and maybe that's what montaigne is getting at too is that he's trying to make us in, in discussing this mm-hmm. as negative as it might be and maybe what we don't want to hear maybe what he doesn't want to hear or maybe i don't know i don't know what he wants to hear but in talking about this that it, it leads us to live more empathetic lives and understand that it's okay not to be okay that sometimes life is... Um, you can't just tell somebody, deal with it, and you'll be fine. That there are sometimes mm-hmm. moments where, like you said, things can't... Things can't be taken in our body or our minds just mm-hmm. break down. Yeah, and I think that... And that's okay. Yeah, and it's just, it's really fascinating to see Montaigne in the, I don't know, the 1580s saying this to have such a cool balanced approach towards emotions it's really cool yeah way to go montaigne 
Yeah, and I, and I think it, it, it makes, at least me, I don't know what your general last impression is, but I think it makes me comfortable in some respects mm -hmm. after reading this because you say, well... You know we are we are fickle creatures, and that's okay because human human beings mm -hmm. are the spectrum of emotion and of of things, and that we're not all just robots. Yeah. Right. Because mm -hmm. when we think of stoicism, we think of something that's cold, calculated robots of right. reason. But mm -hmm. not everybody's like that, and and most people really aren't. No, and that's. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I don't know. I thought that it was a really cool approach, and it was really fascinating for me, at least, to see Montaigne sort of go through all these sort of emotional processes without the sort of vocabulary of psychology and, you know, neuroscience and all that stuff that we take for granted. And he's kind of already arrived at the same sort of conclusion without all of the, the fancy trappings. Indeed. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's what... At least the conclusions he's made, I think, is what makes him so loved and appreciated, is that mm -hmm. he gets at what being human is about, and that it is not just us sitting in an ivory tower, right. it's us dealing with things, and that sometimes some things are too much for us to bear. Yeah. And, and it, it was as if he's saying, like, that's okay, and he's like, well, I, I don't, you know, I, I have my own faults here. It's like, I feel like I can't process these things i'm kind of dumb i'm kind of yeah. dumb and not yeah, really quick really to react yeah. yeah i don't really get it but even in admitting that mm -hmm. he's like well i don't really get it but let me let me explore this right and mm -hmm. like you said like he didn't put it on the shelf he took it off and said let's let's explore what it is to be yeah. human let's and unpack this let's unpack this and i think in that unpacking i think a weight is lifted from us in some regard and that we could say ah yeah absolutely that's what it means and like that's okay it's okay this yeah. is what it is to be human it's what it is to be human it's yeah just all about the journey and at least for us we've journeyed down this one river and i think we've we've hit the end and yeah. i don't know if you had anything to say about anything else to say but this uh, is where I take my leave, I suppose. <laughs> no, I think other than uh, thanking our lovely listeners for yes, tuning in. You. And if you like what you hear, uh, download us on Google Play, the App Store, catch us on YouTube, SoundCloud. And I think that is the about it for that enumerated list. So thanks for listening in, and we'll see you guys next week. Bye. <laughs> Bye for now.